This is Straight Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Good afternoon. Welcome to Think Tech Hawaii's Movers, Shakers, and Reformers Politics in Hawaii series. I'm your host, Carl Campagna. Today we're going to be talking about the challenges that unions face today. Uh, but before I jump into that, uh, I want to just thank everyone for joining me during their lunch hour. We are halfway through the day. We are, in fact, halfway through the work week. And many of us, I, I guess for many of us, halfway through the work week and through the day, but also many of us, most of us for that matter, got to enjoy a three-day weekend, more time spent with our families. And it is actually thanks to our brothers and sisters of the unions that we have those benefits and more. Uh, that's the value. That's one of the values. There are many more, but that's one of the values, and that's, that's the history. Part of the history of unions and labor unions in this country is workers' rights, safety, work, having more safe work conditions, having the eight-hour work day, the 40-hour work week, having a lunch hour, the ability to say, you know what, I'm going to go somewhere and grab a snack and then come back afterwards. You think that that's just common sense. And it's been a while now that we've had that. There's been a good number of years, several decades that we've had that. But we are at the precipice in many ways with what is perhaps the most dangerous and the most, I'll call vicious, Republican Party ever at the moment that is going after and attacking all of our institutions. And we know for decades they've been attacking unions. They've been union busting for decades or trying to. Well, this particular administration and this particular set of congressional Republicans are more cruel and are more focused on the power that they have achieved and maintaining that, that we as the working class people have much to fear. And we need to call back to those days when labor rights and civil rights and just human rights first started to be discussed and brought out and got to the point and reached the point where we are today. We cannot lose these rights that we have. We cannot lose these wages that some people have earned. And we need to raise the wages for many others. This is the basis of the conversation that we're going to have today. And I will welcome to the show, and with really much excitement, I, I let me welcome to the show Mr. Jason Bradshaw. Thank you. And Mr. Tyler Dos Santos Tam. Jason is, uh, and we can get the full screen of everybody here. Uh, Jason is uh, uh, ex executive director oh, of political director. Political director of AFL-CIO. And uh, Tyler Dos Santos Tam is the executive director of the Hawaii Construction Alliance. Welcome to the show, both of you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for the work you do. Thank uh, you. We, I understand, and I believe many of the people who watch the show understand the value and the importance of unions. Uh, but we also, as has been talked about on this show for over a year, recognize that there are challenges, recognize that there are challenges internally, challenges externally. The external challenges are the ones that we are ultimately worried about. The internal ones are stuff that we need to work on. Absolutely. Um, let's, let's kick off a little bit. Let me start off by asking each of you to explain what you do in your respective roles and kind of what got you to where you are right now. So uh, Jason, let's start with you. Well, I, as you saw, I'm the political director for the Hawaii State AFL-CIO. And what we do is we advocate um, for workers at the Hawaii State Legislature um, to um, fight for their, their rights, you know. So we try to advocate for things such as, um, you know, increase to the minimum wage, you know, paid sick days for all workers as an example, um, making sure that their, their rights are protected with workers' comp or whether um, through our unemployment insurance, you know, these are certain things that we try to do to um, protect their rights or try to expand their rights that we believe is important. We also focus on campaigns and elections. Um, we support candidates who we believe um, support working families and we um, go through that process and we try to um, um, ensure that we have a legislature that is willing to support working families. So that is our focus at the AFL-CIO. Okay, excellent. Mm -hmm. Let me, I had one person, because uh, I have my little Facebook post that I do a whole bunch of stuff yeah. on, and um, I had one person challenge this question. It's like, you know, uh, they understand, well, all the money that we give to our union bosses goes directly towards PACs, goes directly towards campaigns, and they, they pick their candidate and they don't let the rank and file have any input. I don't believe that's fully true, first of all, and 
and, and I think that there are always conditions to situations, that it's never, and, and my immediate question to them was, well, but it's always for a Democrat candidate who supports unions, right? And the answer was, well, yes, but what would you say to, I guess, that challenge of the rank and file union members don't always feel like they have a say in what's going on? I, well, I, I don't know the truth of that. Well, I would say that for most um, of the labor unions, the, the PACs that, that are established do come from the rank and file. They are the rank and file members. So they have ability to sit on the political action committees. They have a, the ability to interview the candidates, ask questions, and make recommendations um, to the um, executive boards or to the staff or to whoever is in charge of determining what um, endorsement process um, should move forward. Um, I think a lot of unions try to encourage their, um, their membership to get involved. And um, I mean, and, and make no mistake about it, I think some could do a better job, right? You know, and some could um, try to um, figure out a way to get more involvement. But I don't think, well, I should state that a lot of them don't make the decision just from the top. You know, they, there is a process where um, the candidates are interviewed. There is a process where a survey is sent out, for example, from some unions. They require them to fill out a number of questions on where they um, stand on a number of issues. The survey is generally provided to their membership. The membership has the ability to request um, where these candidates or the incumbents are on particular issues. And I think they try to make it as, as fair as possible um, when, it, uh, when there is an endorsement um, for a particular candidate. Okay, thank you. I, I, I hit you with the hard one right, no, out, right out of the no. gate there. Something that, that, that was at least a little challenging, so sorry about that, no. and, and thank you for the answer. I appreciate that. Um, Tyler, tell us, now it's your turn. Tell us a bit about what you do and sure. what got you here. Uh, I'm the executive director of the Hawaii Construction Alliance. We represent the carpenters, laborers, cement masons, bricklayers, and operating engineers union. So it's the five basic crafts of the construction industry. Um, what sort of defines these unions uh, within the industry is that our members work for the general contractors and thus they have some very common interests. We negotiate our contracts with the same contractors from the very large ones you might see working on the tower cranes in Kakaka or Waikiki down to um, the small mom and pop quote unquote contractors who uh, maybe build custom homes or do uh, sort of office build outs, much smaller things like that. And so in, in the course of working together, they realize they have a lot of common interests, whether it's on the political front, making sure that the legislature is passing laws that help workers and protect them and ensure their safety, whether it's messaging uh, information to the members. Um, they all have newsletters that go out, so we want to make sure they're talking about the same things. And when it comes to development projects that maybe will create work for them further down the horizon, we want to make sure we're being proactive in reaching out to these developers wherever they come from, whether it's uh, the mainland or here in Hawaii, and making sure that they understand the importance of engaging with local workers, making sure that the money that they invest here in Hawaii stays here and, and circulates through the economy. And so my job is to kind of help those unions work together uh, in whatever way uh, they feel best serves their membership. Got it. Okay. Okay. Um, there's a lot going on there uh, between, <laughs> between the two of you. I, I, I was trying to invite a few other members. Uh, from other unions to come in because I wanted to have a nice broad spectrum, but I really appreciate because you guys cover a lot of ground uh, between the two of you. Um, I was hoping to get an HGEA member here, want to hear a bit from them because there's, there's, it's a slightly different perspective with that, uh, so perhaps future shows, um, certainly future discussions somewhere. But um, So, okay. What would you say as far as the state of Hawaii is concerned? Because there's a lot of people who go, well, Hawaii is a blue state. Hawaii is a union state. Hawaii is this, that, and the other. It's just believe that well, how do things, are, well, there's no issues. There are issues. What would you say are some of your greatest challenges as far as uh, unions are concerned uh, in the state of Hawaii? Sure. Well, um, you know, one thing that you definitely point out is Hawaii is a very blue state and we have a lot of successes. I mean, we're uh, very early on, you know, passing a workers' comp law, our prepaid health, and things like that. But as a result of passing these laws in the early years of statehood, um, what we've discovered in the construction industry is a lot of the enforcement pieces were sort of stuck in the 60s and 70s. And so when we encountered an issue where uh, mainland contractors were bringing in workers, um, they were calling people independent contractors rather than employees to skirt some of the labor laws, we discovered that uh, some of the state departments just don't have the enforcement capabilities or um, the fines that are deterrent. So we went to the legislature uh, last session and the session before to raise those fines and make sure that the state has uh, the enforcement capability. You know, our labor laws are only as good as, uh, as the enforcement 
Um, and you know, people are only going to follow the laws if, if there's a deterrent, right? So we want to make sure that that's strengthened. And a lot of the, uh, you know, these mainland states are seeing that eroded you know, day after day. Uh, in, in taking back these protections. And so we want to make sure that uh, those are protected here. So I think um, there's sort of two challenges. One is uh, making sure that our existing laws are well enforced, that workers are protected, and then also making sure that these things don't get clawed back. Sure, that's a big concern. And that's what we're probably gonna talk about in the next segment, actually, is that clawback process. So uh, Jason, what would be some of your comments with regards to some of those uh, local uh, challenges? You, you are right. I mean, we're, we're very fortunate in Hawaii to have a, a very blue legislature, right? And our Senate is um, all Democrats, right? Um, all, all 25 members. So I would say our, our biggest challenge there is really um, what's occurring at the federal level and what's potentially gonna happen at the Supreme Court level um, for the state of Hawaii. You know, there is a case um, that potentially could be heard um, by the Supreme Court, um, and when I say potentially, very likely, and it's the Janus v. Asme case. Uh, many of you may have been aware of what the Friedrichs case was about a year ago. Um, the Janus case is identical to the Friedrichs case in the sense that blue states like Hawaii or California, New York, Washington, will be impacted directly by the Supreme Court ruling. And if the Supreme Court rules in favor of Janus, um, uh, then what will happen is in a state like Hawaii, for example, we will become a right-to-work state, um, at least for the public sector unions. And so in Hawaii, that would include um, unions like HGEA, HSTA, UPW, Shopo, Fire, and the professors. And um, basically what it does is it, um, they get rid of the uh, boot decision from the 70s, and workers will no longer have to pay their fair share or their agency fees, um, as they like to call it. So I do believe um, that is out one of our biggest threats. And like you, you, you nailed it as well, we're on the verge of um, losing some of these rights that we um, fought for you know, um, back in the, in the 20s and the 30s, um, so we, that we fought for so hard for, right? Um, I think you saw it just recently um, in Texas where the overtime ruling, um, so workers no longer have yes. um, the overtime. O Obama's overtime exactly. rule. Uh, was in uh, yeah it just happened literally a few days ago yes uh, where it was overturned that's correct uh, so now it's not a requirement to offer overtime or to pay overtime that's correct. Uh, and, so we're and the, the, the I guess the number of hours is also a, so a piece of that we're on the verge of losing these benefits that I think many people work so hard for and I think some of it is because um maybe people take it for granted these days they didn't you know it's been so long that you mentioned earlier it's been so long since these these victories were achieved yeah. that people just think oh it, we're always going to have the eight hour workday we're always going to have overtime we're always going to have the 40 hour I, I think that's not necessarily we the case. have it until all of a sudden we it, don't exactly. and then we go what happened and how do we get it back and then that, the, it's a big big fight. that's correct so, um, unfortunately we are already at our break so that goes really quickly so we're going to jump more into the right to work and work okay, so let's yeah. get some We'll dig into that. We'll get some explanation of that. Let's understand what that is okay. and what that can mean in the next segment. So thank you again for joining Great. us. Thank you. This is Think Tech Hawaii's Movers, Shakers, and Reformers, Politics in Hawaii series. I'm your host, Carl Campagna. And once again, my guests today are Tyler Dos Santos Tam and Jason Bradshaw, local union leaders here in Hawaii. So I'll see you in a minute. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. Some say scuba divers are the poor man's astronaut. At Dive Heart, we believe that to be true. We say forget the moon. Dive Heart can help children, adults, and veterans of all abilities escape gravity right here on Earth. Search DiveHeart.org and imagine the possibilities in your life. <laughs> welcome back to Think Tech Hawaii's Movers, Shakers, and Reformers Politics in Hawaii series. Again, I'm your host, Carl Campagna, and welcome once again to the show, Tyler Dos Santos Tam and Jason Bradshaw, local union leaders. We have the uh, Hawaii Construction Alliance and AFL-CIO. So thank you again for joining us. Thank you. Me. And um, all right, so in the last segment, we were talking about uh, specifically uh, the, towards the end of it, we got to right to work. And 
let's let's spend this segment talking about right to work and what that means. First of all, what that means when people hear it, what people think it means when they hear it, and then what the ramifications are. So, um, so first of all, right to work. The very first time I heard that, I'm from Chicago. So Chicago's a big union town, we know that. I'm Chicago Italian. I know more about it than a lot of people <laughs> understand. I, I would sit down, I would, I would go with my dad and we'd sit down at, at, at large folding tables with envelopes and we'd be filling envelopes and this is what we, it's what I did when I was seven years old. Uh, so that's how long I've been <laughs> aware of all of this. Um, but the idea of right to work didn't come about in the 70s. I didn't hear about it in the 70s. Uh, it really, I didn't start to hear about it until, I, until in, into the 90s and in, towards the 2000s when, when all of a sudden jobs started to be talked about. As I moved from Chicago to Florida for a little bit, all of a sudden I was like, wait, Florida's a right to work state? What does that mean? Right to work, that sounds like a good thing. Right. I have a right to work? I love that. What does that actually mean? What does right to work actually mean? Well, unfortunately, um, right to work is in 28 states now. So as you mentioned, um, it, it is moving more quickly in that direction. Um, but really what it means is it means right to work for less. And not enough people say for less. What we have is we have data in the 28 states um, that do have right to work, workers make lower wages. They have less benefits. They um, have, um, you know, they're not able to negotiate um, better benefits that um, these other states are able to do. And it is um, surprising when you ask people, like you, you, you mentioned, um, when you ask them, what do they think of right to work? Or what are your thoughts on right to work? And when we ask people, when we ask even potential candidates running for office, and many times the, when they don't know, they just say exactly what you said. We think it's great that um, people have the right to work. And it's stunning that um, they didn't really understand what it was. And the Republicans, I think, or the conservatives, did a great job at messaging that to make it sound like it's a positive um, thing for the states. But the reality is, when you, when you, when you actually look at the data, um, workers make less. They, they have less benefits in these states that are right to work. Yeah, exactly. Tyler, what are your thoughts? Yeah, you know, uh, Jason is absolutely right. It should be called right to work for less. But, you know, we can also call it by its real name, which is union busting. And union it busting. is yeah. all about weakening the power that workers have collectively. Yeah. In these right to work states, people don't have to pay their union dues. And so they're, the people that don't pay their dues end up free riding on everyone who does. And so for, you know, people like me who's in the construction industry, that goes to paying for training and apprenticeship and, you know, all kinds of other benefits. And if people don't pay in, well, that goes away. And it also allows um, a lot of these companies that are non-union to, you know, underbid and undercut and skirt, you know, existing laws. And so that's why we really feel strongly that if right to work comes here to Hawaii, we need to fight tooth and nail to stop it. And, and really these sort of insidious ideas of uh, calling right to work or calling it this or that, you know, we need to scrap this from our vocabulary as well and just call it for what it is. It's right, for, right to work for less. It's union busting and, and it's very ugly. And, and people, when, when I first moved, I'm, I'm sorry, sorry. When I first moved to Florida and I learned and I heard about right to work, I'm like, right to work, okay. Because of my background, I was like, okay, tell me more about what that means. And as it got explained to me, I'm like, oh, right to work means you have the right to fire me for any reason at any time, and therefore I have no rights at all. So right to work does is is a complete misnomer. It has nothing to do with the actual realities of what that employment status is. It is the right to work for less because now they don't have to pay you as much because they have just union busted. They do have the right to fire you because you showed up three minutes early today. You're an at-will employee. Yep. And you're an at-will employee. And, and then, so, and I'll jump to that for a minute. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, um, Hawaii is a strong blue state with strong union presence, and yet, and you mentioned, I myself have been hired as an independent contractor. I myself, more often than not, get hired as an at-will employee to work on construction-related projects. And try as I might, when I'm in those positions, in project management role and otherwise, to bring in my union brothers and sisters, try as I might, I get pushed away. I get pushed back because nobody wants to, they say, pay the price of that. So I leave there because... Uh, I have my opinion about that, but what I wanted to hear as far as you guys are concerned, when someone says, well, I don't want to pay the extra price, I don't want to pay the cost of union, what would you say, what do you say to that challenge, to any non-local developer or even local developer that doesn't want to use union labor, 
What is your statement to them? Well, I think we need to sometimes look at um, the, the union dues is, is sort of sometimes like insurance. You know, not, a lot of times we don't like to pay for car insurance, you know what I mean? But you're, you're, you're glad you had it when you got into that accident, right? Because that accident may have costed you ten, fifteen, twenty thousand $20,000, but your insurance will be able to cover it. Hopefully they're going to cover it, right? I think with, with the union, that's exactly where it's at. It's, it's insurance. They're there to protect you um, should you have an employer that wants to fire you because you showed up two or three minutes late or for whatever reason an employer wants to fire you because you're an at-will employee, right? Um, they're there to be able to negotiate better wages and benefits on your behalf. You can, um, you can go through a grievance process. There's a number of, um, of protections there for you when, you, when you're paying your, your union dues. And unfortunately, in a right-to-work state, what many people don't realize is you don't have to pay your union dues, but the union still has to represent you. And that makes it very challenging for the union. Well, certainly. Yeah. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. it, but that's the union busting. Exactly. Of that, so. exactly. So, but when it comes to, Tyler, when it comes to a, a non-local developer coming in and says they want to build something in Kaka'ako, and you say, that's great, spectacular, wonderful. How can we as a union help you develop and build that? And they say, well, we don't want to go union. Right. What do you say? Well, you know, a lot of these folks come in just looking at the bottom line, but they forget about, you know, what comes afterwards, how to make sure that your work site is productive, that your workers are well trained, that if something happens that, um, you know, you're going to be covered by, uh, you know, workers' comp and all these other things, and you don't have to pay a huge premium later. And so we try to explain this to, to a lot of folks, and, and in many respects, we are successful in doing that. But again, with this sort of messaging that comes from, uh, straight out of the uh, conservative playbook here, um, a lot of that falls by the wayside. So we have to work very hard um, to sort of fight against that. Yeah, and that is. I mean, it's, it's, it's a corporatist perspective. It's understanding it only from the corporate level. Now, certainly at the union level, on the development side, when you're talking about your level of, of union, I guess, effort, it's, it, you also have to work with the corporations. You have to work with them and find an equal balance in there. Did you find that to be a struggle? sometimes in, in, in these conversations and trying to make sure that the interests are being met? I think it's all about you know, education and making sure that um, we can have sort of an open dialogue and open conversation um, with these folks. Frankly, there are some people who you're never going to convince, and that's fine. You know, that's, that's just how it is, and, and we can fight against them. But for those who are open, you know, with more open dialogue, I think you get further with honey uh, than yeah, vinegar. Awesome. <laughs> um, but, you know, that, that being said, that's, that's not the case uh, against a lot of these people that, you know, want to push right to work, that want to uh, skirt the law, that want to force their employees to become independent contractors so they can get around paying for their workers' comp, get around paying for their, their health care, get around things like overtime. Well, and that's one of the things, that when I get hired as an independent, the, the reason I set up, I, I eventually, at first I started off being a contractor as an independent contractor. I'm like, okay, that's great, because I make, wait, I'm not making any more money, I have to pay all this, wait a minute. So then I created, I started my own business, so therefore I got to create a better situation. All right, so fine, I recognized how to do that. But then I have to make sure that I understand how to get into these contracts and how to make sure that what I'm being paid and all of that is being dealt with correctly. Um, so to, to go back, so that's a big issue of that in itself and knowing how to do that. And, and that's where if you've got a union, if you're working with unions, you have support and help in doing that. You've got a whole team of people that are making sure that you're being paid appropriately and per a certain scale and that the benefits and everything that comes along with that uh, is being dealt with appropriately and you're not on your own. And that's one way of looking at that. Um, so, okay, let's go back to right to work. Uh, we only actually literally have a few more minutes left. Um, let's go back to right to work specifically. What is, you mentioned the uh, uh, Janus case coming yes. up. When is that coming up? Well, we don't, there's no specific time frame right now. Uh, we anticipate probably early or 2018. Uh, so we're thinking spring of 2018. Now it could be heard as early as this fall the Supreme Court hasn't made the announcement yet, but when they do, we'll be made aware. It, it's already been um, heard in the Seventh Circuit. Um, the Seventh Circuit obviously ruled in favor of um, AFSCME. So now the right to work organizations are petitioning the Supreme Court to hear the case. And this was the, was, was Janus heard in Seventh Court or was that the Friedrichs? Case? Janus. Um, Friedrichs was heard in the Ninth Circuit. Okay. And that one, so just to get an understanding, that one, uh, the whole scope of this, that one got heard and that one went to the Supreme Court. But at the time, the Supreme Court was eight uh, members, right? We got, you, you, you hate to say we got lucky. I mean, you know, but, um, you know, um, you know so unfortunately Scalia passed. I mean, and, but, but because of that situation, the court was now 4-4 um, conservative 
um, liberal. And so the court ruled four to four on the, on the Friedrichs case. And so the, as, because it was a tie vote, the lower court prevails. So the Ninth Circuit prevailed. So at the end of the day, the, the right to work for everyone across the country didn't happen because the, they went with the, uh, the Ninth Circuit ruling. Um, but that may, will okay. not be the case for Janice. Not the case for Janice because we now know mm -hmm. that Gorsuch is there and he's gonna, we, know, we know where he is on that. That's correct. So what can we do? We need to educate our membership. We need to educate the public and make them aware of um, what is potentially coming and what it means. I, I think um, you know we we know the data, we know the statistics, we know what happens in these right to work states, and I think we just need to be prepared. And I think um, we need to understand j the ramifications involved. Everyone needs to understand the ramifications involved that uh, potentially Janice could. Um, lead to in states like Hawaii or New York or all these other blue states. So yeah. it's really education, and that's absolutely important. Um, educating not just our members, but educating the public overall. Yes, and, and trying to get a better, and that's where that's why I started the show a little bit, saying, by the way, this lunch break is brought to you by your local unions, mm -hmm. and let's thank our unions, let's realize the history of where we come from. And, and for me, that's, I mean, I'm a history major. For me, that's <laughs> where I come from. Where did something begin? How did we get here? What was the value of it? And why would that value wane? Why would that value have ever decreased? And that's what, as we get used to something, as you were saying earlier, uh, we're used to having it now. It's never going to go away. And then all of a sudden, it's gone. Uh, what do we do then? So that's what, we, that's what we're facing, is workers' rights, safety conditions, um, wages. We've got uh, just your, your basic 40-hour work week. We have all of these potential things that we take for granted that can slowly start to be stripped away. Benefits, having health insurance. One of the biggest cost of living issues we have as a country is health insurance. And people don't like to talk about it as a cost of living issue. They want to talk about it as a separate political wedge issue to keep people separate, when reality is it's a huge kitchen table issue. And, and we're fortunate Hawaii to have the prepaid health act, right? So as right. long as you um, work more than 19 hours a week, your employer is providing you health insurance. But unfortunately, other 49 states don't have that. They don't have that. They don't have it. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And that's a huge, huge, yes, Tyler. And in addition to that, that only counts if you're an employee. So if somebody says, well, you are an independent contractor, you, you know, we, we have this agreement, we don't need to provide you with this sort of coverage, but if you look like an employee and you know are treated like an employee and, and all of that, yeah. um, with sort of all the typical rules mm -hmm. that would apply to an employee, then yeah. you're definitely an employee and you deserve that sort of coverage. And it's ridiculous um, for for an employer to sort of claim otherwise yeah, when exactly. the facts are. And, exactly. And real quick, um, people don't realize it, um, um, but. The, there are, even in the Hawaii legislature, they're trying to water down the independent contractor and make it where it's easier for employers to misclassify workers to become independent contractors. Oh. And Ooh. they are doing that. Well, then we, uh, see now, <laughs> we talk about how blue of a state we are and then yeah. things like that come up. Okay, we, we need to explore that one. So thank you both for joining me today. There's so much more to talk about. Uh, we'd love to have you guys come back another time and talk in, deeper into some of these issues. But thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for joining us. This is Think Tech Hawaii's Movers, Shakers, and Reformers, Politics in Hawaii Series. I'm your host, Carl Campagna. Thanks again to Tyler, Tyler Dos Santos Tam and Jason Bradshaw. Local union leaders that we need to listen to, that we need to hear from, so that we do not lose what we consider to be common sense, what we consider to be part of our daily life. We can lose it, and we need to understand that. So thank you for joining us. See you next time.